Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a pleasure to, to have Jelena Gujanova from Koki Vienna. Jelena uh, is a specialist on foundations of quantum physics, so especially non-locality, causal structures, thermodynamics. She did PhD with Sandu Pulpescu in Bristol. Then she moved to the postdoc of Marcus uh, Huber, who you see on the figure in Ikoki, Vienna. And in 2019, she, together with her colleagues, they got a grant to found an independent young researchers group in Ikoki, Vienna. And uh, Jelena is one of the founders of this group. So we are very happy to have her today. And she'll be telling us how difficult it is to implement ideal uh, projective measurements. So please, Jelena. The, the oh, thank you, Michal, for the introduction. <laughs> you can hear me, right? Yeah. My, my screen is very small, so everything is collected in, in different places. All right. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. You remembered your lines very well from our conversation five seconds ago. Uh, and today I'm going to present this, this work. It's a little bit old. Um, if we get time for it, I'll present some follow-up work. Uh, but in general, at the moment, I'm working more to do things with causality and um, uh, higher order processes. But I'm also interested in thermodynamics. Um, right, so this was a uh, joint work with Nikolai Fries and Marcus Huber. And, and as Michal said, um, we have this young independent researcher group in Vienna. This was a big grant um, given by uh, the Austrian uh, Found Science Fund, I guess. Um, and we applied as in, in a three. So it was me, Eamon and Cosentino who applied. And we got money for four years to have this kind of group independently of everyone else. And our group is in Ikoki and the University of Vienna. So Cosentino is officially there. We have some postdocs and some students and um, also some project students at any one time. And maybe interesting for you to know, I recently found out that um, there are like bilateral agreements between academies of science. So Ikoki is part of the Academy of Science in Vienna. So if you want to visit, you need to write to somebody at the Academy of Science in Poland and your visit should then be free or at least heavily subsidized. So maybe that's something to um, bear in mind if you want to come and visit us. Maybe this is something from the uh, uh, Austrian side. I, I imagine that in Poland it will be more complicated. <laughs> Well, you know, I I heard it once, like orally, and I couldn't find any information about it online. And I had to email someone who, you know, he emailed someone high up in admin, and I'm in this like huge chain. And then someone got back to me. So I think it's it's true, but it's very hidden information. Somehow. Or maybe okay, if the if the Polish don't give it, maybe you can ask the Austrians. Somehow. So basically, <laughs> uh, in order to uh, choose uh, to to use such an option in Poland, we have to somehow declare at the beginning of the year that we plan to do it. <laughs> you should declare as many things as possible then <laughs> to keep your options open. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. this is a good strategy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, so right, I'm going to start. So I, you know. I did my PhD with Sandu, as you all heard. So I have to start with a paradox. Um, it's just sort of conditioned in me now. So here it comes. Um, first of all, we're going to think about uh, quantum measurements and uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics in some sense. So quantum measurements are described by POVMs, um, which are normalized. Uh, we have a notion of a post measurement state after you perform a measurement, which is renormalized by the probability of that particular outcome. And okay, a projective measurement is a particular case of a POVM. So this is something that we all know. And okay, now I want to switch to thinking about thermodynamics from a quantum perspective. And this will seem unrelated, but it will become related in seconds. In this sort of paradigm, there's this idea of a global reversible time evolution. Um, so I can evolve some state roads at a later time. And we have a notion of, of thermal states which um, on the emergence of thermal states through entanglements and coarse graining. So the thermal state is usually the exponent of the Hamiltonian normalized by the partition function. And we know that the unitary orbit of thermal states is full rank because thermal states are themselves full rank. Um, so this implies some sort of tension because now imagine the following. So, sorry, can I, can I slow you down for just for a second? Yes. Uh, just like, what do you mean when you say that Parallel states emerge via just for okay. I 
because we also have students in the audience, right? Uh, like, what is meant by by this uh, statement that uh, thermal states emerge through entanglement and coarse graining? Okay, so I would have to refer you to these references, but in some yeah. sense, like thermal states, uh, you, you can think of them as, um, so through certain coarse graining procedures, you will arrive at the thermal state. So it's not necessarily something that comes from, I don't know, minimizing, uh, usually you think of the thermal state as something as arising when you want to minimize the free energy uh, of, a, a quantum, of some system, given some uh, averages for this thing. Uh, you want to optimize the Lagrangian, then you find the states that solve this Lagrangian problem to be thermal. But thermal states also kind of arrive, arise in, in other processes. Maybe this was irrelevant comment for the rest of the talk. Um, but uh, having said, I just actually, what I just needed was a, a equation for thermal states. So can you also comment a little bit about this statement that the unitary of uh, orbit of thermal states is full rank, which implies the third law of thermodynamics? Or what is it? Yeah, so this is there's there's a huge body of references um, that I'm going to give you later for this. So if you have a thermal state, if you have a full rank state, clearly if you perform any unitary on it, it will still remain so, uh, full rank. And various works, which I'll uh, show you the references later, um, will show you that in some sense this implies the third law of thermodynamics and I take this to be an unattainability principle. It's impossible to cool something down with absolute zero with finite resources. Because if you have something that's full rank and you want to cool it to a pure state, you have to reduce the rank. But how are you going to do this? Yeah, if that's you, true. If you have that's true. Okay, so in this sense, okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this th the third law in this sense presents us with uh, this unattainability principle. So then we have this tension. So on, one, on the one hand, I can imagine cooling a thermal state. I can imagine cooling any system actually. Um, and I have some, maybe I have a fridge target uh, coupled to some target system like laser cooling, or I have a dilution fridge, so I call the bulk. But in any case, whatever I do, I have to invest some work in order to cool. And as I do so, the, the target system gets closer to the ground state. How close it gets is limited by the third law of thermodynamics. Right? However, then we have, uh, on the other hand, quantum measurements. So I can imagine measuring a thermal state now. Um, I couple the measurement apparatus to a target system. I do some measurements in the energy eigenbasis. I get some outcome uh, with some probability. And the postulates tell me that this outcome is a pure state, right? Uh, so how can it be that uh, on the one hand, I'm left just by doing a measurement in a pure state of the system, whereas on the other hand, I'm told I'm not allowed to have pure states because I cannot call with unitary operations and I cannot call anything down, right? So this is the paradox. So on one hand, I'm, I don't have pure states, on the other hand, I do. So of course, there is no paradox. This is somehow the uh, point of the paper. It, it's just to highlight that um, uh, that this tension does not exist. In some sense. So here's an outline then of the talk. Um, we're going to go through what the quantum measurement is, or at least what we think it is, so the description and definition. And then, um, as is always the case in physics, you have to idealize everything, right? In, in physics, somehow, I don't know, we idealize everything, and I don't know, I don't believe that most of these structures exist. Like, does a limit exist? I, I don't think so, but somehow we, we use these mathematical things in physics to make our lives easier. And then some results about ideal measurements and how they're not possible. And uh, we'll quantify the energy cost of a measurement and so on. So I have to say that before I start this, this work is like very uh, foundational. So in some sense, in terms of applications, it's not um, perhaps the most insightful because what this gives you is a, a lower bound, right? On, this will give you a lower bound on some amount of energy. And as we all know, like, uh, Physical laboratories are on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, when they do, I don't know, iron trap experiments or something with lasers, they pump in a huge amount of energy um, and a huge amount of photons from the laser just to get 10 good photons so that they can resolve the atom or something. So um, I, I think it realistically, you always need to put in orders of magnitude more into an experiment than what it is um, that you observe somehow. But maybe like Lambda or Asia or something. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Or should I keep going? I keep going. So, what is a, a measurement then? Uh, a measurement is 
something that couples um, a system and a pointer, which I um, assume to be initially uncorrelated, and it transforms them into some kind of correlated state. So on the left here, there's this ball thing. This is the system, and then the square is supposed to be pointer. And typically, the pointer is much bigger than the system, but we'll get to that later. OK, so here is this um, interaction, and then they're correlated. Right? And what I want from this um, interaction is I want, um, uh, I want when I look at the pointer, whatever that means, so I'm not going to tell you what it means to look at a pointer. I'm not going to talk about the collapse of the wave function, why or how outcomes occur. I just imagine somehow they do, and I see something in the pointer that tells me um, uh, a zero or one. What I want ideally is that if the point, if I look at the pointer and it tells me zero, and this is um, given in this pi zero here, that I can infer correctly the underlying state of the system. So if the pointer tells me zero, I know for sure without any ambiguity, the underlying system was also in zero. Similarly for one. I take the case of two outcomes because it's a bit easier. Um, and what one can do, this, this pi i, is just a, a, a conceptual split of the pointer. So the pointer could be made up of many microstates, right? as is usual. You might have a massive magnet or something, and you say, you know, if I see spins mostly up, then I say this is the, the spin state is mostly up. So um, I spit maybe the pointer like uh, into two subspaces, and when I observe the point, and again I don't know what this is, but at this level I, I don't care. I'm just going to talk about the probabilities um, of, observe, of these observations and what conclusions I draw if I were to observe it. So can so I just I... have a one comment, like just on the physics side, like there is one way to visualize this kind of uh, in a physical experiment when that is when you have Stern Gerlach experiment and you have those spin particles that are affected by magnetic field depending on their internal state and they go mm -hmm. either to the kind of upper part of the screen on the lower part of the screen so then mm -hmm. this this position is a pointer then for a spin yes of course but yeah. of course yes you can think of it as anything a pointer could be anything right but this is sure this sure is, this is also um that's a good example um okay so yes when i see Zero when the spins in the stern girl like go to the upper part of the screen, I conclude that, that the spin I measured uh, was in the state zero. Similarly, uh, for the case of one. So, um, good. So now I want to introduce the three fundamental properties that I would want, that I want to have from an ideal measurement. And I'll explain what they are. So uh, the claim is uh, that the ionizing measurement satisfies three fundamental properties. These are unbiasedness, faithfulness, and non-invasiveness. What are these? Um, the unbiased statistic tells me, unbiasedness of a pointer tells me the pointer and the system statistics are the same. So if your spin is up three quarters of the time, then your pointer better be showing you the results up three quarters of the time. It's no, it's no good if your pointer confuses the statistics of the underlying system and the results that it shows you. Um, the second property of uh, an ideal measurement is that it should be faithful. So the probability of your guess is correct. So if I see um, the pointer in the state up, I guess that the system is also in the state up. And if I see the pointer in the state down, I guess the system is also in the state down. Um, and this is the probability that it's, I have correctly inferred the underlying state of the system. And this is captured by um, this function here, C. C, I guess, for correlation. Um, this, uh, maybe I'll have a slide later, I'm not sure. But this C, you know, it's not a measure, right? Because it's, it can be, I can have something that's perfectly correlated in a pure product state. For example, the state zero, zero is perfectly correlated. And this would give me the answer one. So it's, perfect, it's enough to be classically correlated in this paradigm to give me the correct measurement results. Nothing quantum. And the final property that I want, uh, one may want, desire from a, a system is that it's non-invasive. So that means that the system is not disturbed along the diagonal. So I take the pointer of the system, I couple them, I interact them. And this interaction does not change the statistics of the pointer in the measurement basis that I will eventually look at the pointer. So I can keep repeating this procedure and I will get the same statistics. Okay, here is the example I just mentioned. Imagine your measurement leaves the system 
and point to in the state zero zero. This is pure classically correlated it's product and it has perfect correlation. Um, the measurement, this measurement we say is faithful uh, because we always get the answer correct. Right? And you know, if I had this state and I mixed it in with a half state one one, this would also be perfectly correlated because half the time I would correctly guess zero and half the time I would correctly guess one. So on average, I correctly guess all of the time. Okay. Um, and the final thing uh, that we want of an ideal measurement is that it has this post interaction form. This is sort of the ideal post interaction state with perfect correlation. And so your system starts in some state, um, the diagonals of which are cap captured by this uh, row II. And after the interaction, um, these row IIs, I'll show you a picture of this at some point later, maybe. Are in product with this, uh, well, they're in, they, they have this form with, uh, of the, with the block matrices from the pointer. And importantly, the, the pointer subspaces um, are orthogonal to one another, right? So it's, your pointer subspaces cannot overlap, otherwise you're going to make incorrect inferences about the underlying state in the system. So this is something that you have to additionally note that the pointer subspaces you choose to represent your system up and down uh, are orthogonal. So let's do a really trivial example of all of this. Um, here is uh, an ideal measurement of a qubit system, and I'm going to measure it with a one qubit pointer system pointer interaction. The system I take to be uh, this qubit uh, diagonal AB, I could have put the coherences in there, I couldn't be bothered because I'm not very good at matrix multiplication. It's not, it's irrelevant. <laughs> Everything works out just the same. You can have any system. Here. The pointer, importantly, I take to be a pure state, the ground state, be excited, doesn't matter. And of course, this is this matrix. Now I'm going to interact them and I'll tell you what the interaction is at the end, but you can probably guess. And the final state, Will be this one. So now I check the properties. Is this interaction unbiased? So this was a uh, unitary interaction. Is this interaction unbiased? The pointer system and the system statistics are they the same? Well, if I look at the post um, interaction state of the pointer, I actually have the same state as the pre interaction state of the system. So the states are even the same. This is somehow some pathological special case, but I know that the pointer and statistics, the, the system statistics are the same. I have fraction A of the time pointer tells me up and fraction B of the time uh, or zero, fraction B of the time pointer tells me one. And that was the state of the system before the interaction. So that's all good. Next one, is this interaction faithful? Do I always correctly guess the outcome uh, of the underlying system before the interaction, right? That's what I'm interested in. So that's this um, correlation function. And if it's one, then it's correct, right? Well, this is the subspace zero, zero, and I have a one qubit pointer. So this pi zero, I take just to be zero, zero. Let's see. And then uh, on the state one, one, I have uh, pi one, and I take this to be the projector one, one. So I have B, A, and B is clearly equal to one because I started with a normalized state. So just so you have an idea, if this post interaction, I, I, can you see my pointer actually? Or not? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can see my pointer, perfect. Um, so if this matrix um, had terms here on the diagonal between A and B, that would be terms in which I make a mistake, right? Because I would see the pointer in the state zero, for example, but the underlying state of the system is in one. The, the trace of this is, the whole thing is obviously one, this uh, large matrix. So if I have other terms, I'm making a mistake in my inference. Okay, but this interaction is fine, it's faithful. And finally, is this interaction non-invasive? Um, it has the system, have we disturbed the system along the diagonal in the basis that we chose to measure it? And the answer is no. So this interaction, measurement interaction has, is ideal according to our standards. And it also has that uh, kind of complicated form I showed you before. Excellent. This interaction was a C naught. That's good. Um, and in fact, an ideal measurement of any dimensional system, you can have anything you want, by a one qubit pointer is also ideal. Here is um, how you do it. So you start with any system you like. You have a pointer in the ground states, pure state. Well, in non-degenerate cases, uh, ground states and pure states. And I have this uh, C not extended, generalized C not, I suppose, um, 
is defined here with some Paulis. And OK, you can check. I promised you that uh, this will also give you an ideal measurement. So it seems as though all I need to do to have this ideal measurement is couple my system to a pure state and uh, have uh, this generalized phenos, and then I'm done. Right? I'm always getting the correct outcomes. Good. All right, so we say that a measurement is not ideal if any one of the three properties fails to hold. Um, so if any one of these doesn't hold, the measurement is not ideal. And let me just check. Yes, uh, I think I'll come back to this triangle because I'm gonna explain to you what this triangle, maybe I should explain now. Yeah, I'll tell you now. So this triangle is basically relations among the properties. Um, if a measurement interaction is faithful and unbiased, it is automatically non-invasive. I get this for free. If a measurement interaction is faithful and non-invasive, it is automatically unbiased. And the last one, which is, has this sort of um, diagonal shading, is if a measurement interaction is unbiased and non-invasive for all states, because sometimes you can construct examples which are unbiased and non-invasive on particular states, but not it doesn't work all the time. Yeah? If, you relax, if you make this for all states, then you get that your um, measurement interaction must be faithful as well. So this triangle collapses if any one of the properties doesn't hold, but they are independent properties, depends one another, but they have these relations. And this, this one, the shaded one uh, holds for all row. The others hold in particular and for all row as well. So, so, you know. um, so here's sort of like the, the crux of the arguments. Um, faithful measurements, the ones where you have perfect correlations, these are the ones where you never mistake, make a mistake in your inference underlying inference of the system. Um, these are possible if and only if you can prepare pure states. So as we saw in the examples, now we strengthen this to say it's only possible if you can prepare pure states. By the third law of thermodynamic server, you cannot prepare pure states, right? You, you cannot. Therefore, faithful measurements are not possible, which implies that ideal measurements are not possible either, and they're not physically feasible because your triangle then collapses. So this is the uh, crux of the argument, and this is this goes back to then Adam's question of, um, uh, I guess, about the third law of thermodynamics and all the different works done uh, in association with that. So the idea here is that creating pure states costs either an infinite amount of energy, it either takes an infinite amount of time, or you require an infinite amount of particles, or you require infinite control in some sense. You need to have an n-body interaction where n is tending to infinity between these particles. And there is like a whole library of works. Here is just some of them. Um, they will say more or less the same thing. So this is somehow the crux of the arguments. Uh, here's this triangle again with the relations I've just described. So the th okay, faithful measurements are not possible. Uh, any pair of them implies the third, and this star indicates that it has to hold for all system states. So if one of them collapses, one of them doesn't hold, then this whole thing goes away. So since ideal measurements are not possible, we want to determine... Um, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but mm -hmm. can you give some... You said that those faithful measure, like being able to conduct faithful measurements is the same. I mean, can be possible only when one when, when can prepare pure states, right? Yes. But um, how to phrase it? Like, what's the... So, uh, let the, you, the precise, yeah. the precise. Okay, actually, faithful, because I have several versions of this talk and I realize I should have made this more mathematical now. <laughs> At least I was. Uh, yeah. It's the, the correct statement is. Um, let me see if the correct statement is coming. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> the correct statement should be pure states, faithful measurements are possible if and only if you have a non rank, non full rank pointer. If you have a non full rank pointer, you have some zeros in the pointer subspace, which mm -hmm. means that it's, you essentially have to pair, prepare pure states on some non trivial subspace of the pointer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, how can you sort of see this? Mm. So here we had some system and some pointer, and we interacted mm -hmm. them in such a way. That what we want to do is collect the correlations in two very particular subspaces and leave the other subspaces completely empty. The intuitive argument is that you cannot leave the subspace empty if your pointer initially is full rank. 
Mm -hmm. So there is no unitary that will leave the correct subspaces empty. You want these subspaces, the ones which you make an error in, to be empty, right? So my question is like you, I mean, you you gave you mentioned thermodynamic uh, thermodynamics at some point, and you keep referring to the third law, but like uh, so, I guess in the background you are using this res some version of resource theory of thermodynamics. I imagine uh, yeah. somehow. So there is something like I know system Hamiltonian, uh, this, this pointer Hamiltonian, yes, right, and probably you have to because like if you could like. Are you kind of constrained to do only uh, energy preserving uh, unitaries somehow or? Uh, so actually this whole formalism, no, it's very general. So this arrow can actually be any CPCP map. I keep mm -hmm. saying the word unitary because later I'll try and count the energy. And when you want to account for the energy, you want to have unitary operations so that you don't embezzle energy in CP maps. But this, the whole argument also works for CP maps as well. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. arrow could be any, um, quantum map. Okay. Yes. Uh, but somehow the intuition is that in order to have perfect correlations, so one, you need to have certain subspaces uh, which are empty, which have like a kernel, right? So the only way to do this is to have some, a, a kernel in your pointer, some, some mm -hmm. zero subspaces. Mm -hmm. That's basically it. Um, yeah. Um, yes, so yeah, since ideal measurements aren't possible, we want to determine how closely they can be approximated. So what's actually, because, you know, in the lab, we know that measurements occur. People do photonics and people do ion trap experiments and, and things like this, but like also in the lab, in, you know, in photonics, you, you have things like dark counts and you have things which are imperfections and okay some of these you could argue you can make more precise but it's not a limit of technology at the end of the day it's really a thermodynamic uh, constraint that you have um so here they, next we argue that the initial pointer states has to be full rank to avoid these self self-referential descriptions of measurements which rely on pure states and so the, the most natural initial state to take for a pointer is a thermal state it's somehow when you go into a lab, well, I don't, but some do, uh, things are sort of equilibrated at the, the temperature of the environment, right? So in this case, we'll take some pointer at temperature uh, T, which is one over beta. Um, right. And then, okay, since um, faithful measurements are not possible by the third law, we have to decide which of the other properties we would like to keep. Um, and these properties you impose as constraints on your interaction. So, you know, ideally, uh, we want to have measurements which are unbiased. Like the minimal requirement is, is that the statistics of the pointer in the system have to be the same, right? Otherwise, uh, this is somehow very minimal. The non-invasiveness, I mean, if I do very many repetitions of an experiment and I impose that the interaction is non-invasive, the statistics of this experiment don't reveal to me what I need to know about the system. So we take uh, the first property is the constraint that we want to keep. So before we had a system in a pointer and some interaction. And now I'm going to restrict the unitaries, although you don't have to, but I will restrict the unitaries now because I'm going to account for some energy later. And I am going to imagine that the initial pointer state is a thermal state, which is full rank. And so then I perform some unitary and uh, I get a correlated row the S right, S beta. Um, so then the goal is to bring this, uh, well, rho SP or eventually rho SP tilde as close as possible to the ideal post interaction state. Because uh, actually, you know, there's another uh, implication that I didn't tell you about, but I think uh, if you are uh, unbiased, faithful, uh, well, no, I can't remember which one it is. Non-invasive, it implies you have the form of the correct form of the post-interaction state as well. So it is connected in this way. Um, pure states make the best pointers. So the idea is that we want uh, an initial pointer that is as close as possible to being a pure state. So what we do is we split the operation now uh, between the system and pointer into two parts. First, we call the pointer because 
call the points is made a, a basis. And secondly, we correlate the system points and generate as much correlation as possible to affect the measurements. This is a total unit tree and it can be composed we can put two parts, U1 and U2. So here's the schematic thing. I have a system. And here I'm going to conceptually split the pointer into two parts, right? So there's a conceptual split where I have um, N particles all in the thermal state. Uh, it's temperature T, one over beta. And these N particles, uh, in this bracket F are like the fridge. So first we're going to cool, we're going to, okay, in this particular example, I'm going to pretend or use these N particles in the fridge to cool the point. So there's something, a work called the one qubit fridge in this resource theoretic paradigm where one qubit of fridge cools one qubit of pointer. So when I'm done with that, I can throw away the fridge and I have N pointer qubits, which are colder than they started off with. And then I correlate those with the system. Uh, yes. In general, this, these results, I mean, uh, I'll mention later, but they're valid for any uh, pointer Hamiltonians, and you can use whatever fridge model you like. There are many different ones um, for cooling quantum systems. So um, the, the energy then of uh, the energy cost of this entire procedure is equal to the energy cost of cooling and the energy cost of correlating. And this is just equal to the sum of the Hamiltonians and the difference of the initial and final states. Um, right. Uh, so first I cool, example by using the one qubit fridge. This is uh, one reference, there are thousands of fridges out there. And in this particular, um, this particular work, this fridge works by taking N pointer qubits and cooling them from temperature beta or inverse temperature beta to new inverse temperature beta multiplied by the, the energy gap uh, as a fraction of each other. So I, the pointer and the fridge have different energy gaps. This is important. And I exploit that energy gap in order to cool the um, pointer qubits. And the limits of my cooling is given precisely by the ratio of the gaps. So beta gets colder or beta increases, which means it gets colder by this amount. And one can analytically um, write down the cost of cooling. Um, sorry, but you, you have the same number of, uh, of qubits or it drops the number of qubits? I have the same uh, in what, sorry? So because so, like in the previous figure, you, uh, you were using uh, some, you call them fridge uh, qubits to cool down the- Yes, I can set, so I have some system, it's thermal, but I conceptually split it or I cut it in half and half of it sure. becomes a fridge now. Yeah, yeah, and then so then you're left with a system which was half like has small number of qubits, right? Yeah, yeah, that's do. okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I'm asking is like like you here have a transformation from ah I see because you just take the p like so it yes, allows yes, yes. you okay so it's like uh, you say you basically present there what happens not to the whole system but to the the p part of the system. Yes, yes, yes. So the point of okay, the okay. temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the point of qubits changes by this amount. And I don't know what happens to this fridge. We have to get uh, hotter. <laughs> um, and in this paper, they can analytically computed this um, the amounts by which it cools. And it's obviously a function of the number of qubits that you have. One qubit fridge, one, one from the fridge, one from the pointer. And it's a function of the energy gaps in the, the fridge and the pointer as well. But this thing is the thing that clearly diverges, right? Uh, I don't know how, can you see that it diverges? It diverges with what? With, what? with everything. So you can, it diverges with the number of particles. Well, okay, increases linearly, but it diverges here in this. Uh, uh, like as this. beta goes to what infinity. Uh, yes. yes. So temperature goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. So in all of these, uh, and here is the gaps. So in all of these uh, um, uh, protocols, sorry, um, it's always the cooling that that blows up. So this this thing diverges. I'll show you a plot of it in a second. And the correlating part, after you've cooled it, so you have something cooler, so it's a bit better. 
a correlating part is always finite. And it can be phrased as some optimization, which one can solve analytically. So what you want to do is you want to minimize the energy cost of correlating the system and the pointer um, over all unitaries, which are unbiased, so they preserve the statistics, such that you maximize the correlations. That's what you want to do. You want to maximize the correlations, minimize the energy, uh, and see what is the minimal amount of energy I need to get the best correlations I can this procedure. So we have an analytic um, expression for this. It's not uh, terribly uh, complicated. It's to do with the binomial distribution of energy levels in the uh, thermal state. But the maximum amount of correlation that you can achieve for any unitary interaction of this form is a function of the number of qubits you have and of the inverse temperature. Um, so for pointers that start in a thermal state, the Cmax depends on the temperature, the spectral gaps, and the dimension, if you like, the number of particles. And this maximum amount of correlation is a very intuitive thing. Let me show you quickly here. Um, this is the maximum amount of correlation you can get for any unbiased unitary. And these plots show different numbers of particles. So for 20 qubits, 100 and 1,000. Uh, already, as the size of my pointer grows with compar in comparison to my system, um, the rate at which the correlations are varied increases very quickly. Uh, similarly, as beta approaches infinity, or in this case, 1, the maximum correlations you can get also improve. Right? So either you have an enormous pointer or you have zero temperature, but something has to survive. And, okay, the-, the um, So can I ask, you know, like, I often have this like CS point of view, like, can you move to, uh, can you uh, give, give, yeah, this expression. So, so asymptotically, I guess for fixed beta, as you increase the number of, particles and this stuff goes to one right yes you can see the yeah folder. i mean i see on the plot on the mm. uh, on the formula uh, on the formula not exactly but let's say i trust it goes mm -hmm. so just i wonder how uh like what's the rate is it exponent uh, exponential does it go exponentially to one or with respect to what to n for fixed to beta n. Well, it's complicated because you have these factorials right sure, sure. <laughs> no, no no but like no okay but let's say like is it like here sure no but i mean asymptotically like uh, how one well so because in it you have all this complicated stuff in the in the partition yeah. function in the normalization sure. as well right so you have all of this again yeah. to the power n so i i you can help sure. me <laughs> see how it scales <laughs> there again okay, okay. Yeah. thanks <laughs> right so in the um yeah the correlating part uh what you want to do then is so enacting... i i have a question so uh, is it uh, to me it's not very clear so you said that uh, when you have more number of particles the correlation could be maximized right so how physically we can see that physically so, you mean yeah. from the plot no not from the plots i mean uh, in a physical system does it is it intuitive i don't get it so if you have anything to say on that um, well, I, I guess so, right? Because Im imagine if you have a magnet or something like a, a hard drive or something, and you just want to um, measure, uh, uh, you, you just split it into two parts, and these are the spins which are pointing up and the spins which are pointing down. And let's say you take um, an, uh, your projector on one of these spaces is like, you know, I say that the spin was in the state zero if most of the hard drive or at over 50, you know, is showing the state zero, right? So the more particles I have, somehow the more... Um, that, uh, but that represents a system, right? So uh, you're talking that uh, the system would be bigger, but here N represents the number of particles... N represents the, the number pointer. of particles in the pointer. In the pointer, right. So you're yes. saying that the, even if the system is very small... No, the system and, is one spin, right? Or the yeah. system is something. And, and I'm you saying have a this, pointer I have a, with 10 spins, spins right? Then or a computer really... hard drive, or yeah. an, an old style one, <laughs> okay. which spins, which has thousands of spins, right? And it has mm -hmm. to give you a number, zero or one. So yeah, you sure. look at it, and if most of the spins are, are pointing down, you, you deduce that the state of the system is down. 
And yeah, the most spins... in, in the case of hard drive, the hard drive itself is not the pointer, right? It's the head which is acts as a pointer on the hard drive, right? No, why? I mean, okay, uh, okay. To get the, so the hard drive, imagine that you have a lattice of spins, and this is the new model for the pointer. If most of the spins point up, you say that this measurement result is up. Yeah, I agree that you're talking about majority board, but uh, I do not still see uh, like how this relationship is valid in terms of when you have just one qubit state and maybe 10 qubit pointer state, how this is going to uh, increase the uh, precision of the measurement or because that will uh, that is a consequence of correlation, right? Between the system and the pointer state. Mm -hmm. So, so I do when, not you, see when that. you have a larger system, it's e so basically, um, uh, the, the only way I can see the increase in the precision is that you repeat the number of measurement and you decrease the uncertainty. Otherwise, no, so, so imagine you have a very large system. Here, this is a conceptual system mm -hmm. and pointer, right? Mm -hmm. After the interaction. And I haven't told you the dimensions of anything in this schematic. Yeah, yeah sure. And here I have the, um, uh, okay, this system, this is the, this is the pi zero projection onto the zero pointer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the red areas are the ones that I want, to, uh, my correlated subspaces. These are the mm -hmm. ones that I want to put the most correlations. Okay. Now I say, imagine both of my system and my pointer started in full rank states, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to enact some interaction, unitary map, whatever, that pushes as much of the correlation, as much of the probabilities to the correlated subspace, bearing mm -hmm. in mind that I have constraints on the interaction, linear constraints such that certain things are satisfied and that the trace of this thing has to be one, right? Mm -hmm. So if I only have qubits, uh, there is only a, a finite number of ways I can rearrange the correlations. Mm -hmm. So I, I only have four diagonal terms such that this is still trace one. If I have mm -hmm. a huge system, mm -hmm. I can arrange the distribution in such a way that I have most of the distribution in the correlated subspaces while having epsilon amounts in these gray striped mm -hmm. boxes. So this is how the dimension helps you because you can, uh, the, the distribution becomes sort of, I don't want to say more and more continuous, but in some sense, this is what is happening. You're pushing as many correlations as you can to the... So pr probably uh, there should also be a condition that the pointer size should be greater than the system size here, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, this is obvious because if you have a qubit and a qubit, mm -hmm. then you cannot even distinguish what is measuring what, right? Yeah, so after, after I mean, uh, you, if the size of the pointer is bigger than that, uh, bigger than the system size, right? You might not get this uh, advantage of n, right? No, so the pointer is bigger than the system. And yeah, the, surely, the bigger... but at a certain point, this, that advantage will go away, right? And no, that would this, depend it scales, on the system size. It, it only gets better and better. So if you have an infinitely yeah. large pointer, then you will, you will achieve perfect correlations. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and you can see also by taking the limits of this expression, right? So if you take the limit as the temperature of the pointer, yeah, I mean, surely mathematically, I can see that. Yeah, it's correct. Mm -hmm. But yes, and but, if I have an infinite dimensional system, I can also mm -hmm. uh, get perfect correlations. Thanks. So here is a schematic of something that we did, uh, I guess, maybe realistic. We took we have two graphs on top of each other. OK, so in this graph, I have a system which is a qubit. And I have a pointer which is six qubits. Okay, so not far off from what you were asking about. And I choose an energy gap in the microwave regime. And I imagine that this, the, they start at room temperature. So this beta EP, I take to be one over 30, in whatever units I had at the time. Um, so then I do this protocol. I start at room temperature and I cool with a fridge that has some fridge gap given by EF until the fridge is exhausted. So that means I cannot lower the temperature of the pointer anymore. I throw away the fridge, I have a new pointer. And then from this new pointer temperature, I correlate from this uh, beta prime. So uh, what is the cost, uh, the energy cost of uh, cooling is given by this um, brownish plot, which is clearly divergent as I approach perfect correlations. But the energy cost of correlating is always finite. And actually, it's um, it's it's always bounded by uh, a half because I just 
to be perfectly correlated, I just need one qubit to be perfectly correlated, right? I just need to flip a spin. So the cost of correlating is always finite. Um, so this is in the summary of the work. The theorem is it's an unbiased measurement, one in which the point in the are the same, can always be implemented at finite cost and in finite time. Uh, the corollary is that to be faithful, uh, to have this perfect correlation, the pointer then makes the mistake. The system has to be cooled, and this cooling is subject to the laws of thermodynamics. And as a consequence, um, we find that obtaining reliable knowledge about quantum systems generically requires macroscopic quantities of work. So perfect knowledge is infinitely uh, expensive. And these results don't just hold for qubits. They can be they're valid for any system, any pointer, any Hamiltonians. But the point is, is that our recipe for computing, say, these energy minimums or whatever, involves diagonalizing a Hamiltonian and then arranging the eigenvalues in ascending order, which is some very difficult task. I guess Michal would know what complexity class that's in, but also that is very complicated. <laughs> um, so the general message is that pure states are not for free. So in some quantum thermo works, um, people use things like measurements to drive engines. Um, which is very nice, but then they don't uh, you know, take into um, account that you know, the intrinsic cost of having a pure state, they take pure states to be for free. So if, if you do this, of course, you can sort of get these nice bounds, but in reality, uh, you have to pay for these things. Uh, is there anything else we want to say? Uh, no. So, right, one can also think about doing further work on this topic. So uh, the quantum of the classical transition requires some macroscopic quantity of work. So your pointer needs to have a sort of broadcastability property, and there needs to be some robustness in this um, whole scheme. You may want to investigate fundamental collapse and other foundational questions. Um, good luck. If you do, let me know how that goes. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea about these things. Um, one follow-up work that we did was um, uh, work estimation and work fluctuations in the presence of non-ideal measurements. And I can briefly, very briefly tell you about that. I don't have all the slides for that. Um, but in essence, what happens there is that, um, uh, well, the two-point measurement scheme uh, is a scheme used to um, estimate the amount of work done um, on a system during some protocol. And typically, it's done by assuming a perfect projective measurement before the protocol and a perfect projective measurement after the protocol. So now that we realize these measurements aren't perfect, um, one needs to add a correction to the estimate of work because the, the argument is somehow is that energy delivered by measurements is not free of charge and must be realized to supply the measurements. And then what we do is we show that um, Jarzinski equality um, can be maintained. Um, in this scheme, but so that um, the general Crookes relation uh, doesn't hold anymore if you don't have perfect measurements. And the final thing, which is a, a more general thing that people are thinking about, is um, really the sort of, they call it the, the triangle of infinity, this infinite time, infinite complexity, or um, infinite energy cost. And people think about these things in terms of lambda erasure and other schemes which takes something to infinity in this idealization. And I think Marcus Huber's group um, uh, is working on things in that direction. So with that, I would like to thank you. And then we'll see if there are any more questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Yana, for the nice talk. Uh, we'll have time for questions, comments, uh, remarks to the speaker. I've got one. Please. <laughs> that makes it Please, because because I, I I'm quite lost about like it, when you have this division of the of the pointer into the pointer and the fridge right mm -hmm. so, so I, I don't quite get how can you use because before the division you you have like like basically the the qubit in the same temperature right then you divide yes. it they are still in the same temperature or or, or not. Yes, but to make another assumption is that I assume they have different energy gaps. So if you don't want to conceptually divide the pointer, you can bring in a fridge and call it. So what I assume here in the top left is that the energy gap of the fridge is larger than that of the pointer. 
and then I can use the protocol and be. Ah, uh, oh, okay. okay, 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 got it, got it. Thank you. Able to cool it. But okay. if you're not happy with the spit, you can just bring in a fridge. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Um, some fire questions. I can hear the police. Um, they've come yeah, to this they're... office to yours now. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they are not coming for us. Okay. Uh, okay, I have. Uh, okay, I have a few questions actually. So, you decided to keep uh, unbiasedness of the measurement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, just in. Uh, okay. Ju ju okay. Just my general question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> kind of why to just keep this uh, this re requirement? Because, like in fact, I mean, okay, in practice, like for example, when you use uh, those prototypes of quantum computers, uh, right? Given by the whatever some some companies, measurements are typically quite. Uh, faulty in practice you know you have some biases and they are just not perfect and people realize uh, i mean yeah so um, like would it change would the situation change or your consideration change uh, a bit if you just throw this assumption away and kept the other one for example well, okay, okay consider measurements that is um non-invasive right mm -hmm. is a sort of kind of so the individual measurement outcomes and the statistics generated for many measurements, they don't allow you for, to make like reliable inferences either about the pre, the, the post measurement uh, system mm -hmm. state or the pre measurement system state. So mm -hmm. such a measurement doesn't reveal any information about the measured system. Uh, well, okay, I would argue because what people do, I mean, this is like free form discussion, right? So, so what people do in practice, they do characterize those measurements. So they sort of know how faulty they are. And then, you know, you, they, you, you can somehow unfold this bias, you know, just generally, uh, like. Yeah, no, I agree. So, okay, for sure, I agree that um, different, in different laboratory schemes, you could argue that uh, different uh, properties are not holding, mm -hmm. right? But here I'm constructing, right? So when I construct something, I want it uh, at the least to, rep to mm -hmm. um, uh, reasonably replicate the statistics. But I agree with you in mm -hmm. the lab that measurements are biased, like, I don't know, uh, photon detectors or something like this, right? Exactly. So mm -hmm. then you could say that in the lab, the reason this measurement isn't ideal is first they have these biased counts. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I have one. Okay, what I wanted to ask about. Uh, to, to, to. Right. Uh, ah, okay, so you gave one. So when you drop this ideal assumption, Right, because mm -hmm. you you argue okay if you want to perfectly satisfy those three uh, conditions, your the energy cost is infinite. But like your uh, you, then you gave some specific scheme, right? No, okay, so I said no. I, I, I said if you want all of these, so if you want perfect score, an ideal measurement is one in which one of those three things doesn't hold. So let's yeah yeah sure sure sure. So like if you want perfect measurement, then the energy is infinite the, the side and the, right yes, yes yeah yeah so then it's reasonable and you did relax this perfect condition by let's say focusing on faithful measurement and dropping the other two conditions yes. uh, and uh, you presented some specific protocol based on the schooling and then correlating in specific way yes. right uh, so that and you have some energy consumption uh, uh, associated okay. with some costs. Yes. So, uh, but this is just some like, do you know how optimal this protocol is? Like, can like uh, can one derive like some fundamental bound that you know to in order to get this and uh, let's say this precision, right? Or you know, so so 
like because you i guess quantify this faithfulness non-invasiveness in, in some way right yes I, uh, I think so what you're doing is uh you want to know if you can infer let's see uh from this plot you look at this plot and you say mm -hmm. well first you choose okay uh the, the larger plot is the cost of cooling and the smaller plot is the cost of uh, correlating. So this pink thing is an inset of the thing below. So I have some pointer at some temperature and I look on the graph and I say, I want to call, I, I want 0.9 correlation. 90% I want to be correct, uh, the points to be correct. Then I look on the graph and read off, I need a hundred units of whatever yeah. energy to do that. Yeah. Is this what you were asking? Yeah, so I'm asking how optimal. So because this is a result of some pro some specific protocol, right? Ah, uh, yes. No, this is yeah. So it's specific to the fridge that you use. Yes. Uh, and what what I'm asking is like how close is it? Like I mean, like what are the fundamental bounds, right? Let's say if you want to attain correlation one minus delta, right? Using some resources, right? And mm -hmm. like what those resources need to be necessarily, right? Okay, so you're asking what is the optimal fridge in some sense? Yes, yes. yes. No, I don't know, but there are many, I, I think they will Or have... fridge or some, because you have some specific scheme that you have the fridge, you have the pointer, and then you do something, you know, I'm asking like, okay, I can append thermal states and do thermal operations, right? Like, uh, and I want to optimize, I know, the energy costs or something, right? Just more generally mm -hmm. um i don't so uh i i have to i don't know because there are so many different cooling protocols that i don't know sure 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 which one is optimal also they have different numbers of steps in them each time right mm -hmm. so i didn't count uh i think different uh I wouldn't know. No. There are so many different cooling protocols. I, I don't sure, know sure, sure. So, so I, you know, I'm. Well, what I'm asking is about the supremum over all possible that we, you know, like the, uh, about all possible protocols, right? Like. Just ah, like, you yeah. mean ah? Okay, so. I, I think I understand what you're saying. So, here I told you. Oh, I seem to be scrolling in some bizarre direction. Fifty-two. Uh, yes, so here I said, I mean, I don't have to call the pointer in the beginning, right? But the, the only point of this was to say that this is where the divergent cost from. The correlating cost is always finite. So if you give me a pointer in a system, I can give you the optimal correlating unitary to get the maximum correlation out of them. But I didn't have to call in the beginning. This was just to say that I can make the correlation even better if you allow me to do that before. Is, is this your question? Well, not exactly, but right. So, so, so my question was like about like assume you can, you know, you have you can have some abstract pointer, right? That yes. has some and has some energy, right? Uh, yes. Like some Hamiltonian, but and it's in some specific temperature beta. So mm -hmm. uh, you can optimize about those like Hamiltonians of this pointer. But you are allowed to perform just energy conserving unitaries uh, only, like on the whole thing. Okay. Right. So, and you want to attain some correlations, let's say one minus delta. Like, what is the best thing you can do? Right. Because, like, here, what you showed is like, okay, I can first, first cool my system down, right? And then use the cooled system as a pointer, right? But one can imagine that, you know, I mean, uh, like there might be some different protocols, like depending on the structure of the Hamiltonian that you are using for the big pointer, let's say. Yes, so um, in general, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, okay. So your question is, I consider cooling and correlating, but your question is, is there something else you can do to get to better correlation? Yeah. Um, 
well, I don't know how you would substitute correlating for any other operation, right? Sure. Ah, okay, okay, fundamentally, you want to know whether, okay, because I use the assumption that pure states are better, so I call something to be more pure, and then I, I, I correlate. But your question is, is there something else in physics that would produce good correlations without having to use this paradigm or call it? Yes, or, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, let me think. Uh, because I, in my problem, I don't have so many... I've lost my share screen. Share so screen. somehow your uh, your uh, your screen is frozen, it seems. Uh huh. Let me stop it and then I'll reshare it with you. Yeah. Uh, it seems to have disappeared somewhere. Hmm. Ah, because it was full screen. Okay. Um. I guess my answer to this is that. Uh, I don't, what parameters do I have with the, uh, so you, you want to enact a protocol on a system and a pointer, and this necessarily has to be a function of those input things to produce correlation. So what do I have? I have in the pointer, I have some temperature, I have some spectrum and I have, um, yeah. some dimension. So already yeah. I know that correlations are improved with increasing dimension and with lower temperature. So the only thing left is a different spectral gap, but I, I believe that, uh, I think the gap is sort of irrelevant. Uh, I think gap so is in other words, like if you have a paper, paper on that, the gap is important, I think, the spectral gap. No, uh, I well, think I mean, okay. A paper if, on that. Um, okay, like this is like very, just let me just phrase like my question if you have uh, now this formula, right? So I'm asking like, about, let's say, the optimal correlations you can get mm -hmm. when you optimize both over the pointer T. Uh, so you have a freedom to choose spectrum, I understand, right? Uh, ah, so sure, no, so beta, and no. over the thermal. Unitaries. No, I understand. So all of our protocols are optimized yeah. for all S, where S is unknown, which is a reasonable assumption because when you measure a system, you don't know anything about it, right? If I knew something sure. about the system, why would I need to measure it? So you're completely correct. Of course, I can have better correlating protocols if I know something about the system, because then I can arrange the probabilities in a better way if I know that it has some skewed distribution. But these protocols were derived for any row S and that means we took it to be maximally mixed in the beginning, like no information. Okay. But then if you knew something about Rho S, then you could, you could change your correlating unitary and then you would get something better. Yes. All right, cool. So are there any further questions or comments to Yelena? Okay, if not, let's thank her again for a very nice and instructive talk. We meet next week. Thanks guys.